Hello, my name is John Rizzo, and I'm an Arts Westchester teaching artist, and I'd like to welcome you to Arts Westchester's Virtual Arts Workshops. I think one of the most difficult things with people getting consistent results when they're using a cell phone is that they're not watching out for some of the fundamentals that people use whenever they're using a 35 millimeter DSLR, digital single lens reflex camera. So a cell phone follows the same principles as, I, as a DSLR camera. But since many people have not had that training, it's probably tough to try and get the results that you want without a little bit of that knowledge. And that's what I'm going to show you here. The settings on your cell phone camera are mostly automatic. And that's different from a 35 millimeter camera where you as the photographer make the decisions and change the settings to get the results that you want. With a cell phone, you can get great results, but you have to be aware of certain things. For example, motion. It's very, very important that you hold your cell phone steady when you're taking the picture. And that's harder to do than with a, a DSLR 35 millimeter camera. That's because the cell phones are so light, there's almost no weight to them versus a heavier camera where you can, you can balance it and counterbalance it. So that's the first thing, hold it very steady. The second thing is look at the kind of light that you're working in. Available light is very different. For example, we have window light, which is a soft light usually that's daylight and it comes through the window. Many times it bounces off something, which creates a very nice, beautiful, soft quality, which is great for skin tones. You have incandescent light and that is more often light bulbs and spotlights and things like that that has more of an amber kind of yellow orange cast to it. Um, that's another kind of light that you use. You have fluorescent lights. That's a uh, more of a, a little bit whiter than an incandescent light. And oftentimes if you're in a fluorescent light setting, you might be in a room that's got 50 of the lights on the ceiling. So the light tends to be a little bit more even and it's easier to work in. These are the things you have to watch out for. You have to try and put your subjects, whatever they may be, people or, or uh, interiors, whatever it is you're interested in shooting, try and find the best light to work in since you are going to be using available light with your cell phone. Now let's talk about shooting outdoors. You have a sunny day, you have a cloudy day. There's plenty of light. The problem gets to be that sometimes when it's sunny and there's no clouds, it, the light can be very harsh. Um, so for example, at midday, noon, one o'clock, two o'clock, when the sun is high in the sky, it's very harsh coming down because there's nothing diffusing the light, which creates shadows on the faces. So you have to be very careful. Midday is the worst time to take photographs if you're going to be in the sun. So what you have to do is try and work when the sun is lower in the horizon. Sunrise, sunset, those are the best times of day because the sun is low. The light has direction because it's an angled light and there's also color in the light. That's very important. When you have a cloudy day, lots of clouds in the sky, this is very good for people photography because the light is very soft. It's soft and it's broad. What happens is that the clouds are, are diffusing the light from the sun, the harsh direct light from the sun, and they're spreading it. So they're spreading it and making it very soft. So what that means is that the shadows are very soft. So the, the ratio of the bright to the dark spots in your image, the highlights in the shadows, we call them, is very short, which is beautiful because the tonal range will be smooth. That's what you want. When you have, and you'll have very low contrast, when you have high contrast, like when the sun is very hot and it's beating down on your head, then you have uh, too much of a range between the dark shadows and the bright highlights. So that's called a short tonal range. And that's usually not the best way to work 
in if you want photographs of people or, or whatever because you'll have very deep shadows and very hot highlights. However, sometimes I have to work in that kind of light. I have no choice. So what do I do? What I do is, if the light is very hot and there's no clouds in the sky, I'll turn my subject around so that the light hits them in the back of the head and it acts like a, a hair light. And then what I do is I move in close to be sure that I can get a, a good, a good uh, exposure and a, and a good composition with the face and I make the exposure which your cell phone will do automatically on the skin tone. So what happens is I've got beautiful soft light on the skin and then I've got a hot hair light on the hair and it's really very very nice. That's how you get around some of these tricks. Another tip I'd like to give you is regarding camera angle. Now this is one thing that most people do without thinking about it is that they almost always take their photos by holding their camera up in front of their face. So everything, no matter how tall they are, five feet, six feet, the camera angle is always right in front of the face. And there's nothing wrong with that, except that there are many other camera angles you can use. You can use a high angle. You can use a low angle. Many times on assignment, I've taken photos by having my camera on the floor because it gives you a completely different perspective. So maybe there's something that you want to photograph and it looks pretty good from your standard height, but if you change the camera angle, it can be a thousand times better. And it's always best to explore those options if you want your photographs to be more interesting. Another tip I wanted to give you is about anticipation. If you want to capture those great moments and they can be fleeting. If you're at a sporting event or a birthday party or whatever it might be, try and anticipate when something that you would find really interesting or might be classified as that classic moment is going to happen and get yourself into position. If you, let's say you're at a graduation ceremony and, and you know the parents and the, the graduate are about to see each other, you know that they're probably going to hug and show some kind of emotion. That's called anticipation. So if you're out of position, if you're 40 feet away when this is going to happen, you're not going to get a very good photo. But if you think about it, and make an effort to get closer so that you're 10 feet away or 8 feet away, then when it happens, you can get a much better photo. Anticipation and being willing to put the camera where it needs to be in order to get those great photos, all the while holding it as steady as possible because camera motion a lot of times creates a little bit of blurriness which can take the sharpness out of your photo. So always be cognizant of the fact that you have to hold it very, very steady. Now let's talk about composition. It's important to have good compositions and to work at trying to make your photograph as interesting as possible. Don't always put things in the middle of the frame. That's boring. Oftentimes, the photographs that you love have great compositions, even if you're not aware of it, and that's because the photographer has worked at that. Now, there's a thing called the rule of thirds, and what it is, is it splits your frame vertically and horizontally into thirds. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine squares. And what the rule of thirds says is that try and place your subjects on those intersecting points to try and make it more interesting. If you have mountains and you have a hiker, don't put the hiker right in the middle. Try and put the hiker at the, the far edge or maybe at that quadrant where they intersect right there. And then you've got the mountains over here and you have a beautiful dynamic composition. That's important. Also with cell phones, don't be afraid to move in close. You can get in close. Cell phones are everywhere. People are used to having camera phones put in their personal space. It's different with a DSLR. Normally people are more apprehensive when someone takes a camera with a professional long lens and gets very close to them. They get nervous. They don't get nervous with cell phones. 
and that's an opportunity. So that means that you can get in close and do it what I mentioned earlier in terms of moving your camera angle lower and trying to get interesting shots. The thing is so light that you can do so much with it. Don't be afraid, take advantage of it. And if you have the later model iPhone that has the portrait mode feature on it, this enables you to take a photo and then blur out the background. So what you're doing is you are separating the subject from the background, which allows you to focus in and create a little bit stronger composition. Now, cell phone lenses, cell phone cameras are generally very wide. And what that means is it renders most things in focus. So it's more difficult to do this. When you have a DSLR camera, there are different settings on the camera that allow you to control the amount of focus in your image. So this portrait mode uh, option is really nice because it gives you a little bit of that DSLR ability while still using a cell phone. If you like this virtual workshop on cell phone photography, then please visit artswestchester.org.